So from that perspective, right, from the midrash of the rabbis, that is where we get that part of the Judeo-Christian portion from. But I'm going to go ahead and say that this, these things create religio. And we're going to get into what religio is in a second. But then some of y'all say, but in the book of Jubilees and Jasher, it actually talks about this episode, right? So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, y'all should have the PDF, so you have the scriptures right in front of you. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read the portions in relationship to what we're discussing on today. So in the book of Jubilees and Jasher, Jubilees chapter 30, verse 2, and there they carried off Dina, the daughter of Jacob, into the house of Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, and he lay with her and defiled her, and she was a little girl, a child of 12 years. That's where y'all get that to. Oh, Devon, she was only 12 years old. That's, you're getting it from Jubilees, right? Okay. Jasher, 33 and 11. And he sent and had her taken by force. And Dina came to the house of Shechem, and he seized her forcibly and lay with her and humbled her, and he loved her exceedingly and placed her in his house. That's Jasher, 33 and 11. This is where a lot of y'all being influenced by the dogma. This is something special, and I'm going to explain it to you. Remember the stuff we read from the rabbis, the Agadah from the rabbis, and their Midrash within Judaism on how they created these novel accounts of what happened to Dina? That's very fascinating, right? I'm going to show you something. Let's, let's go into this. Let's learn a little bit about Jubilees and Jasher, all right? Just a little bit, just a little bit, right? There's a book called uh, Enoch and Jubilees, well, it should just have Jasher, that's the wrong image, but the you'll see on the PDF, the last page of the bibliography, and that one is the proper book. So this is not correct, but I'll correct it after this is over, right? So when this a PowerPoint is available, that y'all can go through it yourselves, okay? So let's read this. Jubilees. The book of Jubilees was originally written in Hebrew. The author was a Pharisee, a doctor of the law, or someone very familiar with scripture, and religious law. Since the scrolls were found in what is assumed to be an Essene library uh, and were dated to the time of the Essene community was active, the author was probably a member of that particular religious group. Jubilees represents a hyper-legalistic and midrashic tendency, which was part of the Essene culture at the time. Midrash refers to writings containing extra legal material of anecdotal or allegorical nature designed either to clarify historical material or to teach a moral point. Jubilees represents a midrash on Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through Exodus 12 and 50, which depicts the episodes from creation with the observance of the Sabbath day by the angels and men to Israel's escape from Egyptian bondage. This is on the introduction page of this book. The book is called Enoch, Jubilees, Jasher, Banned from the Bible. So what we're seeing here is that even though the book of Jubilees was found Amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls in a Qumran cage in that community by a Essene set, it is nothing but Midrash. Now, I don't have time to go into the text and analyze it and show you how we know it's Midrash, but the same Midrash that you get from those sets in Qumran is very similar to what you saw in Judaism by the rabbis. It's just their form of rabbinic Midrash. It is not scripture. And it was not canonical like Enoch was amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, that's very important. So before you go back and quote Jubilees, understand what you're reading. I know some of your hopes got crushed right there. But it's all good. Let's keep going. Jasher. There are several books which have come to us entitled the Book of Jasher. I talked about this before. One is an ethical treatise from the Middle Ages. It begins with a section on the mystery of the creation of the world. It is clearly unrelated to the biblical book of Jasher. Another was published in 1829, supposedly translated by Flaccus Albinus Alcunus. It opens with the chapter 1, verse 1, reading, While it was the beginning, darkness overspread the face of nature. It is, it is now considered a fake. The third and most important is by Midrash. First translated into English in 1840. Do you understand where you're even getting this from? It opens with chapter 1, verse 1, reading, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God created man in his own image. Enoch, Jubilee, Jasher, banned from the Bible, page introduction. 
It's Midrash. It's Midrash. <laughs> Y'all are quoting Midrash as if it's scripture. And make sure you got the right book of Jubilee, I mean, of Jasher, because one of them is a forgery, is a fraud, is a fake. The other one is unrelated. And then you have the one I think most of y'all have, which is the one that you read that's Midrash. Midrash is not canonical scripture. So don't quote that stuff to me anymore. Because if you're going to quote this to me, you might as well quote all the stories that we read from the rabbinic traditions of Agadah. That's their Midrash. That's all you're doing. Midrash Agadah. Let's move on. Let's move on. We're getting warmed up. Now, this is how you really get into the scriptures, right? And again, I'm going to shout out our upcoming classes because in our upcoming classes, we're going to teach you this. Whenever we attack some form of scripture, this is the methodology we're going to address it with. And I'm going to show you through this lecture how we are addressing that. All right? I got about an hour left. Let me see how much we can get done. All right? So religio. Why are you using this term religio Judeo Christianity divine? Religio's definition is scrupulous or strict observance of the traditional cultists. What I'm saying to you is that dogma that's formed, and I define dogma, is created by traditional cults. <laughs> and there's a scrupulous and strict observance of the dogma within these traditional cults. So if you're coming from the Judeo-Christian perspective, you're going from the traditional Judeo, I'm going to say traditional Judeo-Christian perspective, you are part of a traditional cultist. This is a Latin word, Roman, Latin word. That is what you're involved in, religio. And we know that that is also part of the word religious. So y'all are being bounded within the traditional cultists and you accepting Dina being raped by Shechem as, a, as part of the scrupulous and strict observance of that traditional cult that you're part of. So in order to get away from that, we are going to use several approaches to this subject matter. And the number one is the preponderance of the evidence. I'm going to tell you what the preponderance of the evidence is, and some people may not know what that means. So let's get into the preponderance of the evidence. The preponderance of the evidence is one type of evidentiary standard used in a burden of proof analysis. Under the preponderance standard, the burden of proof is met when the party with the burden convinces the fact finder that there is a greater than 50% chance that the claim is true. So now the burden is on me because the traditional cultist, the one that issues the dogma that you have a strict observance to, is teaching via the translation of your English Bibles, via the books of Jasher and Jubilees, so Jubilees and Jasher, and Midrash Agadah from Judaism that Dina was raped. So now I have to show you with the, the, the preponderance of the evidence that that is not the case. And I'm gonna show this to you with the, all the resources that I'm gonna share. Now, what are these five steps? The first one, I've mentioned it already, the preponderance of the evidence, the second one is comparative cultural analysis. I'm going to look at the culture in ancient Israel and compare it to other ancient Eastern cultures because we have to extract the legal codes because this is the lens in which this, these narratives are seen. When you read scripture, the Torah was written in retrospect. I'm going to say it again. The form of the Torah we have today was written in retrospect and it was written by a priest scribe. So you'll have a lot of priestly language encoded in Torah. And from my position, right, the form that we got, it started with in the royal house of David. When the royal house of Israel was established, it could be, it could be uh, David, it could be, um, you know, it could be uh, David, it could be Hezekiah, it could be Josiah, wherever it was, their royal court had prescribes, and those prescribes took whatever form of the text they had, and you saw they were discovering a book, and they went and they redacted it to what we have today. There's a lot of changes that went away, but they were the parent of this information. That's very important. So when you go back and you read these narratives, you have to have legal codes in your mind as corrective lenses in order to see these Agadah, these narratives. That's important, okay? So that's the second, the second uh, method is the comparative cultural analysis. The third method is the lexical analysis. So 
we're going to go into the words that's being used. Now, I don't have time to go in depth into a Hebrew grammar, uh, uh, I would say Hebrew grammar decoding um, or unveiling because that will take a lot more time. So we're just going to stick with the lexical analysis, not a full linguistic analysis, just touching on a lexical analysis so we can go and find these words, the root form of these words in an appropriate lexicon and find out how it's defined. That's very important. The fourth point is intertextual analysis. We're gonna take various scriptures within the Tanakh and we're gonna compare them with each other in order to deduce the common denominator and extract the principle to then go back to the narrative and apply it and see how it plays out. That's important. Lastly, we're gonna deal with the contextual analysis. That means we're gonna read the context and understand in the narrative who's who, where they at, what's going on, how it's being done, where it's at, uh, what it is, et cetera. That is very important because if you just read the context, it answers itself. But some of y'all may need more than that because you're still stuck in the religio state of mind. We're gonna break you out of that today. 